So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, two related themes, belonging and sacred community. We all have, as human beings, an inherent need to belong. There's, there's no escaping it because the very process of becoming a human being is socialization. And in order to be socialized into the family of human beings, we have to belong and we have to experience that contact. We're given the context of a culture and a language. We have the physical environment that shapes us and the world in which we live. And we are socialized into the fellowship of a family, an extended family, a community. These things are part and parcel of being and becoming human. God intended it this way. He meant for us to be a social reality, and those of you who've heard me preach on this before know that I have likened the Trinity to a social reality. This community or fellowship that is one in purpose, in nature, even somehow in being. But this social reality of God is mimicked in creation, and we are a social reality as we become in the image of God, created and human and socialized. The other thing that has become, should be obvious to all of us, is that we are socialized not just into an individual family, but into community. And this is also a very necessary sort of thing. Not all of us have all gifts or all skills or all capacities. And so we have to nurture these as a form of specialization if we're going to make real progress. If I had to weave my own cloth, I would never have time to preach a sermon. If I had to make my own shoes, I would never have time to weave my own cloth. That could be problematic there too, right? If I, you get the picture. We've specialized as a society. We've learned to rely on one another. We have different instincts, different capacities, different skills, different outlooks, different kinds of intelligences. And we use these various gifts in community to get something done that's bigger than ourselves. Just look at this city. It's bigger than any one of us could ever create, ever. And yet we all benefit from the structures of this city, from the amenities of this city, from the commerce of this city. This is a context for micro-communities as well as a larger community. And what we have in the form of church is something that we don't often name this way, but I think it's important that we do. It's what's called sacred community. I would like to argue that all true community is sacred. But I think particularly when we think about the context of church, we're talking about a community that chooses to be shaped by a certain set of beliefs and values. And in the Western context, we've been extraordinarily shaped by the power of printed word. So received our texts through a process over time, canonized as they come to us as sacred text. And these sacred texts have informed us about who we are and what we believe, and they've brought us together in sacred community. Now, this isn't uniform community. This is not community, again, that has exactly the same read on that sacred text or the same understanding or brings the same experiences to that text. We don't all share the same lenses because, again, we come at the text from different points, different experiences in our family lives, our socialization, our groups, our cultures. Different lenses because of our own mental uh, outlooks and capacities. Some of you out there, I don't know who, might have tremendous capacity for 3D think thinking and reasoning. Some of you out there couldn't do something in three dimensions if you had to. 
right? Some of you can do the New York Times crossword puzzle. You're very verbal. You're very quick with pulling up hints and these sorts of clues. But then some of you can't do algebra to save your life. I was very blessed. I had a math teacher in high school who could teach math to a fence post, as we used to say, and I was the fence post. God bless Mrs. Berg. Just have to say it. So again, when we come to sacred community, nothing's changed. We come to sacred community as a diversity, a diverse collection of individuals with all of these vast perspectives, skills, outlooks, intelligences, and perspectives. And our job now is to somehow want, one, excuse me, somehow learn to honor one another as imago dei, imago Christi, people created in the image of God and in the image of Christ. It is by the Spirit of God that we learn to recognize the face of God in one another. And there is something about that recognition, something about the, the deference and the respect we accord one another in sacred community that makes all of the difference. And as a director now for several years, not just pastoring in one context, but sort of macro pastoring in a variety, I see how destructive different ideas elevated to the position of judgment and rightness can be in the context of sacred community. We can have a consensus around something, which is helpful. We can have differences of opinion that may be resolved one direction or another. But I have witnessed churches torn apart by people whose egotism, whose narcissism, whose insistence on being either the victim or being right or both, whose judgments of others and whose willingness to bend the truth via their perspective have destroyed vital sacred community. The scripture, if we'll stay to them, helps us understand how to safeguard ourselves from this because the scripture makes it very clear. God values you as a person made in God's image. God values you as a person made in the image of Christ. God values you as one to whom the Spirit can be sent and one to whom the Spirit belongs. And God calls you as every other individual into this space of sacred community. But it is there then that we must be reminded that we have mutual obligations in this space. If our spirits are to thrive, if iron is to sharpen iron, if grace is to be multiplied, if the good news of the kingdom of God is to be shared in a broader context, and if the message is that you have been forgiven and you are reconciled to God in Christ is to be shared with the larger community. We have to keep these things clear, these priorities before us. So as we're listening to the text in Romans 1, which we read just a few minutes ago, Paul is offering a greeting as a Jew Greek, someone with a Jewish mother, therefore of the Jewish persuasion, but a Greek father, therefore also a Roman citizen and a Gentile. He, with this dual hybrid sort of identity, that's an interesting thing too, how many of us, if we studied it, have hybrid identities, right? We come to identity as a complexity, you see. Some of you, how many, can I just ask, you know, it's, it's a, I, uh, there are no ICE people present that I'm aware of. How many of you immigrated to this country at one point or another in your life from somewhere else? Just raise your hand real quick. Lots of you. If you came from another country to this place, you probably have a hybrid identity, if you've lived here long enough, you probably, in some respect, consider yourself American, particularly if you've adopted citizenship. But you also will never lose the identity that goes with coming from another place, whether it's El Salvador or Mexico, whether it's South Africa, 
or England, Japan or India. Wherever you may have immigrated from at one point or another, you're always going to have a core of that identity. So this, this hybridity that we bring to identity is part and parcel of what we have in Christian community too. And Paul is speaking out of this hybridity in Romans chapter 1, and he is seeking to engage in this Gentile mission. Now recall that Jesus had come as Messiah for the Jews. And while Jesus did interact with Samaritans and other non-Jews, his primary focus was Israel. But after his ascension and after Pentecost with the diaspora coming to Jerusalem and hearing the gospel in their own language and thousands of people being converted and then missionaries going out, Paul then engages missionary journeys in which he goes to Rome and other places. And so here he is at the seat of power of the then empire of the world, Rome. Rome is the the empire. There isn't another one. It is the empire of the world at that time. Dominant in every respect. Absolutely masterful in its military capacity. Able to send legions to foreign places in a very short period of time. No, they didn't have C5 galaxies, but they could get across the oceans and to various distant places pretty quickly and could impose their will at will. And it is in Rome, in this place of the seat of power, where the Caesar resides, that Paul chooses to write. He's writing to this group of people. And he's sharing with them his own hybrid identity and the way in which they're all going to be knit together in Christ. Let's just take a moment. We read it, but let's take a moment to read again. He's set apart for the gospel. The gospel promised through the prophets in the Holy Scripture regarding who? His son, Jesus, who as to his earthly life was a Jew, a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was appointed son of God and power for the resurrection of the dead. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to faith and to obedience for his name's sake. And he says quite bluntly, you are that group. Here's the next line in seven that interests me so profoundly. To all in Rome who are loved by God. Hmm. How many do you think that was? All. To all in Rome this city of dominance, this city of wealth, this city of power, this city of oppression, this city of violence, to all in Rome who are loved by God. And what are the Romans called to be? A holy people. Does that sound familiar? What had God called Abraham and his descendants to be? a holy people. There was to be no difference. The very call extended to Abraham by grace is now being extended to the world by the grace of Jesus Christ. To all all those who God loves in Rome who are all called to this thing called sacred community in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a different kind of kingdom. It's a different empire, to be sure. It's a different set of values. It's a different life. And all of us, whether Jew or Gentile, are called into this communion, this gift, this sacred community. I love that in this passage. Well, we could go... uh, actually to Romans 5 and see more along this line. Um, but, but we're going to pass on that for the moment and go to Proverbs, our Old Testament text, which was read next. Proverbs is very brief. It's warnings against follies. This is wisdom literature, recall. Solomon has written, perhaps with the aid of others, a collection of wisdom sayings of truths. And it's interesting to me how oftentimes in the discussion of difference in our church, 
I don't mean Santa Clarita necessarily, but in di discussions of difference in our church, we're much more interested in being right than we are in being in community. We value somehow much more the idea of individual correctness and truth than we do the idea of being together in sacred community. It's an interesting thing. And it's spoken of here in the six things that are detestable. Haughty eyes, of course, has to do with pride, right? There's nothing wrong with eyes per se. Nothing wrong with the tongue per se, except that it can tell a thousand lies. And this is interesting, isn't it? Let's just take a moment and look at the perspective of witness. Okay? A thousand people standing in different points geographically witness one event. Do they all see it the same? They do not. You see, we can only tell the truth about witnessing an event when we tell it from our own partiality. When we take our perspective and absolutize it against the perspective of another, we tell a lie. That's kind of strong, isn't it? It's kind of strong, but I think if you think about it, it's true. You see, the truth is always more complex. The truth will be understood when we hear the thousand perspectives that witness that event. From that will emerge a picture that will generally tell us the truth in time about what took place. Now, as we put that to words and live with it over time, it will morph again. Because now the truth will be encapsulated and it will be codified in language. And then we'll have to have a way for that language to be memorable and to be transmittable over time. So what is witnessed as something true morphs in itself even over time. I say this not to, not to upset anybody. I say this because we need a degree of humility about the realities in which we live in order to be patient with one another as we move through time and as we experience life in sacred community. It is vital that we have that capacity and that elasticity in our thinking. Mostly, I think, the Proverbs is not addressing the complexity I just identified, but the lying tongue is specifically speaking to deceit. We all agree that murder or the shedding of innocent blood is abhorrent, although it's increasingly common. A heart that devises wicked schemes, we call it the schemer. Somebody who's always trying to create an advantage or take something from somebody or devise something that will be amusing or destructive. Feet that rush to evil. Here are the ones that interest me most. A false witness who pours out lies seems a repetition of the lying tongue except now we're talking about witness. Now we're talking about somebody who lays claim to knowing something for truth that they may not know for truth or may be an outright fabrication. And finally, a person who uses these tools to stir up dissension in the community. God hates to see dissension in sacred space. That's not disagreement. Disagreement's going to come. Different perspectives are part and parcel of the created order in which we live. Difference is to be expected. It's dissension that's problematic. It's the warring of perspective that's problematic. These are the things God hates. We read again in Romans, and I'm turning out of chapter 14, 7 to 9. 
Romans 14 is an interesting chapter because it's the weak and the strong and it's about perspective. It's about how we live and how we're embodied in this world and the things that matter to us in terms of culture and what we take in and what we do with that. And the Jews and the Greeks, or the Jews and the pagans, the Jews and the Gentiles more accurately, had a number of things on which they didn't agree on, particularly around diet. You can imagine what some of those were. Diet became an issue of division. The keeping of festivals became issues of division. And Paul is addressing this in early sacred community, and he's saying, don't let this be a dividing point. There are those among you who will only eat vegetables. Let them eat vegetables and don't judge them and don't let them judge anyone else. There will be those among you who will eat meat. Don't judge them and don't let them judge those who only eat vegetables. It's, the problem becomes when we make the gospel the gospel of veganism or the gospel of vegetarianism or the gospel of anything goes. That's the problem. Because that's no good news for anybody. The good news is, is that there's plenty for all and we've been called into sacred community and you have choices to make between you and your body and you and your creator. Amen. That's the truth. That's what the scripture allows for. When we narrow the tolerances beyond what scripture itself allows for, we do ourselves a disservice because we're already quite bound, actually, in culture and time by sacred text and by our own context. And God is magnificent and huge, immense. I'm not talking about physical size necessarily. I'm talking about the scope of what God is. All-encompassing. And when we take the view that our little narrow slice, our little narrow something is the only way to be before God in the universe. We do ourselves and those around us an injustice. <clears throat> Sacred community doesn't flourish because we're all on exactly the same page. Sacred space flourishes because we encourage one another to pursue what has been created within the image of God the image of Christ and the freedom that we're called to as we seek to serve him with our individual capabilities and capacities together. Sacred community, I would say, is exactly like what I said at the beginning of the service about singing. It's about holding difference in tension while we bring something of ourselves together to make a beautiful noise as a witness to the world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a unique voice of witness to the world. Many of you have chosen to be a part of this great movement, this great denomination, this faith. But I just want to encourage you and strengthen you and bless you today to go forward in our individual capacities and differences and cherish that space that we're called to together that God has declared sacred.